conservation has done 40 years of save the pandas, save the rhinos, if they go extinct, everything's going to hell. And it's been a lot of doom and gloom with now a lot of emphasis on, here's a problem, how do we solve it? Ben Novak leads a research team devoted to reviving the passenger pigeon, a bird that went extinct more than 100 years ago. It's part of a broader project created by the Long Now Foundation, a nonprofit dedicated to promoting long-term thinking. The Long Now wants to bring back other species too, and even has a woolly mammoth project in the works. They call the process de-extinction. We sat down in the UC Santa Cruz laboratory where Novak and his team recover, store, and sequence DNA in hopes of de-extinctifying the passenger pigeon. In a nutshell, uh, the Passenger Pigeon Project is about trying to use DNA from extinct passenger pigeons to recreate uh, as close of an organism to the passenger pigeon as we can get. Contrary to the silver screen and public belief at times, you cannot actually get DNA from bugs trapped in amber. People have been unable to get DNA from dinosaur fossils. Uh, they're just too old. But you can get ample amounts of great DNA from museum specimens, taxidermied birds. If we continue to get the public support we need, then our projected goal is to have some form of, of passenger pigeon uh, by 2022. Most people, when they think about pigeons, they think of the street pigeon, the rock pigeon, the, the rat with wings, they don't like them. They think of them eating french fries behind McDonald's dumpsters. And that's, that's not the passenger pigeon at all. It's this really beautiful kind of regal bird, slate blue back, the males have this red breast. And what set them apart from all the other species of pigeons in the world that live on every other continent and island uh, was that they formed these really dense flocks and their population numbered up to the billions. So these flocks would be several hundred million birds to a billion birds uh, in size and they would darken the sky for several days. This species was kind of a super species for a very long time, tens of thousands of years. But what's the point of bringing back a bird that clearly couldn't cut it in the modern world? Novak says these massive flocks created important disturbance cycles clearing out entire tracts of forest with their feeding habits and allowing for new growth and an enriched ecosystem. It's kind of like how the Forest Service purposely starts fires, except with dense billion bird megaflocks. So the bird we create will be, uh, you know, hopefully a bird that uh, looks like a passenger pigeon, acts like a passenger pigeon, could fool anybody into believing that's the original passenger pigeon, you know, but at the genetic level, it's a band-tailed pigeon that's been adapted into being a passenger pigeon. So it is somewhat of a, an odd sort of hybrid. There are natural analogs for this kind of thing, such as grizzly bears all over North America carry little bits of polar bear DNA from hybridization that happened 10,000, 20,000 years ago. And over time, most of that polar bear DNA has been bred out, but a few of those genes have stuck around. We're trying to actually look at that and design and control the traits that we want to actually survive through this humanized selection process. When it comes time to start thinking about releasing these birds to the wild, we have a big challenge for us in the fact that passenger pigeons are uniquely nomadic. They don't migrate from one set place to another. Historically, when you look at the records, they go wherever the food is plentiful and the weather looks good at that time. I came out with the provocative idea of taking white homing pigeons and dyeing them to look like passenger pigeons, training the homing pigeons to go from one spot to another, and then trying to fool our baby birds into following those homing pigeons from one spot to another. We control their chromosomes. It's really not that difficult. Life uh, finds a way. Everyone asks about Jurassic Park. They, they bring it up for so many different reasons. I mean, it really is the cornerstone of thinking about this topic. It was a huge cultural phenomenon around the world. And now with uh, Jurassic World in theaters setting the world record for, for sales on the opening weekend, which I was part of, I went and saw it, of course. The one thing I would say to everyone about this is, one, we've been thinking about the major issues of de-extinction far more in depth than any of the writers of a book or a movie could go into. If 
we do this right, there will undoubtedly be unknowns. If you put a species into an ecosystem that hasn't been there in 100 years or 10,000 years, what do you do about things that might go wrong that you didn't think were going to happen? Specifically for passenger pigeons, people worry. They think, oh, flocks of billions, that'll be horrible, it'll be, it'll be disastrous, it's gonna become a monster. We even got an email of someone telling us to pull out now before our monster pigeon destroys the world. And I have to iterate this. People caused the extinction of the passenger pigeon in the 1800s with muzzle-loading shotguns. They managed to cripple a species of five billion in the span of 50 years. And today, we can watch these animals from satellites as they go with GPS tags. It's not like these birds can get away from us in ways that we can't control. Uh, and, you know, it's a pigeon. What is honestly the worst that could happen? Novak says a much more serious critique than the fear of monster pigeons comes from conservationists, some of whom call de-extinction a distraction that diverts money away from the traditional, proven conservation methods. While Novak agrees that conservation is underfunded, he rejects that kind of zero-sum thinking and believes de-extinction presents an opportunity to succeed where traditional conservation hasn't. The real point of de-extinction as an emerging field, you know, beyond mammoths and, and passenger pigeons, is this notion of, of revolutionizing conservation. The real moral fiber of conservation for the last 40 years has been extinction is forever, so prevent it. In my view, that, that, that extinction is forever should have never been the foundation of motivation to begin with because it implies that there's an, a finite end to solutions. Really, conservation has done 40 years of save the pandas, save the rhinos, if they go extinct, everything's going to hell. And it's been a lot of doom and gloom without a lot of emphasis on, here's a problem, how do we solve it? And what we're just trying to bring to the floor are more solutions, solutions to new challenges that traditional forms of conservation have proven again and again to just be utter failures at confronting. That original foundation of conservation was about the separation of nature and human beings, which is a very unrealistic thing to have. And I think we have to reconcile seeing that human beings and the ecosystems and environments we've made are part of the gradient of the entire biosphere. Will this new creature be considered a GMO? Will it be considered an exotic species? Will it can be considered its own species at all? The sad thing is, in the discussions that come up about law, especially when they consider what if this thing is called a GMO, is that we're living in kind of this weird debate and GMO backlash time. Europe, Europe doesn't like GMOs, they're very against it. The United States has corporations that run agricultural GMOs and causes a lot of distrust uh, in the public. These groups that are against GMOs can really hinder progress at a laboratory site. We haven't really tasted the bite of that backlash yet, but we will undoubtedly uh, you know, spark a few hate groups. When I was 14, I read an article about a team of scientists that took a beam of light and stopped it in a vacuum. Took a beam of energy and stopped it in one space and time and then let it go. And you know, that just really resounded in me that human beings really can do anything if they really push and figure it out and apply themselves. That's what this is about. If we can't get our pigeons by 2022, we'll, well, we'll for damn sure know how to get them by say 2025. Um, that's the real goal here is producing a body of work that aids conservation projects with the developments we make and continues marching forward to doing something revolutionary. <laughs>